Now, friends, in this fifth chapter of our book, Service and Reckoning, I want to have a good, quiet, personal talk with each of you about this all-important subject of our outreach. Each of us as Christians has a world. Uh, that world may mainly consist of our home, it may include where we work, if we're working outside the home, or at school. But it's the main center of our lives that we're to, from which we are to share as far as outreach goes, as far as service goes in reaching others or ministering to others. And there is a tremendous amount of responsibility here. Probably the area of least responsibility today amongst Christians is in their service. It's so easy to get busy for the Lord and uh, rush around here and there doing all sorts of things. But that type of uh, activity and outreach it doesn't stand up in the long run. And it's not uh, a good testimony and it's not fair to those uh, that are ministered to because the Lord's work requires depth. It's an eternal work and there must be depth and reality. That's the only kind of work that he does and he wants to do that work through the Christian. And let's think for a moment here of uh, Colossians 1, 27, 29. Colossians 1, 27 to 29. <clears throat> the Lord is seeking to establish responsible, mature Christians. And those are the ones that he is free to use. And our responsibility as Christians, is to allow him to develop us and prepare us. His responsibility, of course, is to do all the developing and, of course, in turn, to do the work through us. And we think here of our verses in Colossians 1, Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect or mature in Christ Jesus. For this I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Well, Paul is saying, as usual, he's saying an awful lot in these few brief words. And uh, the main thing that he says is that the Lord Jesus Christ in us is uh, the life of our service. And it is uh, the Lord Jesus whom we share and minister, teaching. And uh, I like here where he says, teaching every man in all wisdom. As we grow in Christ and as we realize all that's involved in his uh, bringing us along as individuals, we learn what is required in bringing others along. We learn that it isn't something that it can be done overnight. We learn that uh, the Lord doesn't use pressure. He, uh, growth doesn't work on that basis at all. And we learn wisdom. We learn how to handle people. We learn how to care about them. We learn how to wait and be patient <clears throat> as they grow. And uh, the Lord wants our heart burden to be the same as His. We are to have the burden of the Holy Spirit for others. Uh, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. That our goal for each one that we're in contact with, whether it's the unsaved or the saved, our goal is that they might in time grow into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he might be their life, that he might be their all, 
not just to see the unsaved become saved and let it go at that uh, and have fellowship with our Christian friends. No, it's far much more than that. That our one burning uh, deep heart desire is that each one might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And Paul says that he, he labors and he strives, but it, all of it is according to the Lord Jesus working within him. He said, which worketh in me mightily. And our heart burdens must be from the Holy Spirit. And another factor here is that if we're going to share with others, if we're going to see others uh, become mature, uh, it must spring from what is real in our lives. It isn't that we don't make any outreach or don't attempt to win others at all while before we're mature, but that while we are growing, uh, most of our outreach will be uh, in the form of training. There will be souls saved. There will be Christians who are uh, helped, yes. But all of this will be mainly used of the Lord to teach us and to train us, uh, be interwoven in, into our uh, Christian growth. <clears throat> uh, in my work of uh, counseling during these past 20 years or so, in contact with many folk throughout the free world, correspondence enables one to reach far out. The, the basic problem amongst Christians, I feel, is a poor beginning. <clears throat> all, all the problems, almost all the problems, spring from a poor beginning. That people are uh, one to the Lord on a very uh, slim basis, so to speak, and uh, many who are one are, are not uh, helped after that. They're not uh, cultivated enough either before they're saved or after. And it's hard for many Christians to realize, uh, many personal workers to realize, that there is a, an awful lot of cultivation required before a person is brought to a decision. And the more cultivation there is there, the healthier the birth will be. And uh, the stronger the growth will be afterwards. We mustn't be afraid to spend time with people and to uh, help them uh, carefully and uh, thoroughly come to their decision for the Lord Jesus Christ. We often uh, see in special meetings or in all or even in our, in our soul winning, uh, once, now and then we'll see someone come to the Lord, uh, it seems like, right away. Well, it isn't really that at all. It, it Actually, there's been preparation there beforehand by someone else, in most cases. Because if there is going to be a real new birth, there must be heart preparation. And that's, that's what we must see in our outreach, to, to be willing to share carefully and uh, bring the person to the place where they can be reborn. We, we've uh, brought this out a little bit on page 31, how that uh, Peter was um, careful not to seek to win these folks to the Lord, actually win them, until they, their hearts were prepared, until they reached out and asked. He witnessed to them, he witnessed the truth and the facts to them to prepare them. And he didn't seek to actually win them until they were ready and knew they were ready. And uh, one of our sad problems that exists today amongst personal workers is this idea of uh, learning some sort of system, a manipulation of uh, salvation verses, for instance, memorize them, and uh, then have a system as to how to approach people and take them through the little routine of uh, verses that brings them to an automatic decision. Uh, it's very easy, and it's uh, seemingly quite effective, 
but it is not the spiritual way to win people to the Lord Jesus Christ in such a way that they'll be have a healthy birth and have a good start, a good solid beginning in their Christian life. It isn't fair to people to bring them in uh, on the easy route, the simple route. There's too much involved. Uh, birth is only the beginning of a life for eternity. And that birth is important, and it, it should be a good, healthy birth. And that's, that's the burden that I want to share with you in this chapter, the burden of responsibility, the responsible personal worker. And every Christian is a personal worker. Every Christian uh, should seek the Lord for a burden for others, In our uh, church work, many people become become so busy uh, in serving in the church that um, their home life is neglected. Many churches are so busy three and four nights a week that uh, it puts an awful burden on the home. It puts an awful burden on the children when the parents are so busy at the church and related areas. And I, I want to speak for a moment now to uh, mothers and wives, mainly, that it's so easy to uh, slap things together at home and rush off to some Bible meeting and uh, some church uh, activity, whether during the day or the evening. And... Uh, Dad comes home from work and he's tired and hungry and uh, things aren't just right. That's not that's not a, a, a good testimony. The Lord is not able to adequately honor that and work through that. If uh, a housewife and mother puts her family in the right perspective, that she is careful about her own Christian life and growth so that she might be a spiritual, godly mother and wife. It's her home, even ahead of the church, puts her home first, Christian home. And it's hard to perch in this way. It's uh, not hard to maintain it. There's not all this rushing around the last minute. If the home is kept up, it becomes simple. And if the husband is, for instance, is not saved, or if he's a younger Christian, maybe not coming along so well, this testimony is required for their good, for their benefit. And uh, that goes for the children, too. If the children are lonely and uh, the parents are preoccupied with the Lord's work, the Lord, the Lord isn't in that. The Lord is uh, given the, has given these parents to be brought up in the admonition and the nurture of the Lord, and that requires time, that requires heart, that requires love, that requires attention. And the Lord isn't going to create a tension, a tension in a home where his his work at church and so forth is in tension against the home life. He, he's not going to do that. That isn't what he does. He, he has it worked out so that the whole thing works smoothly when uh, things are in their proper relationship. And the greatest ministry for any Christian woman, any Christian wife or mother, is her home, her family. That's, that's the ministry that is far outstrips a pulpit ministry or any other type of ministry. And that's the greatest lack we have in, the, in, the, in Christian circles today. The, the Christian home has become weak and insipid and unspiritual. So <clears throat> my burden is to share with you this burden of uh, putting first things first. They're, they're the strongest preparation for an unsaved child, an unsaved mate, an unsaved neighbor, unsaved co-workers, the strongest preparation is a godly life. 
where their hearts are prepared so that when something is said or when some uh, written material is shared, they'll be open to it. Responsible Christians are what are needed today. I remember before I was saved, <clears throat> I didn't know what a Christian was. I'd never heard of a Christian. Didn't wouldn't know one if I saw one in or out of church. And I was mainly interested in those days in baseball. And living in the Wheaton area, I knew about Wheaton College, but I didn't know what it was. I knew that there were people up there who were different and strange, but I didn't know what Christian college was all about. But it worked out, the Lord worked it out without my realizing that, uh, realizing it, that while I was in high school playing ball, once in a while the uh, high school team would go over to the college and uh, practice and uh, play practice games with the college team. And in that way, I was brought in touch with some of the college ball players when I was in high school, back in 1928, when Wheaton College was Wheaton College, incidentally. And then, uh, many years later, after I was out of high school and grown, oh, 26, 27 years old, and I was a ball player then, and I was at the same time pretty much of a drunkard. The two aren't supposed to go together, but they did in this instance. But now and then I would uh, watch college ball games, and uh, sometimes I would work out with the college team. Well, by that time, I was becoming more and more aware of my own personal needs and a little more observant about people, especially ball players. And I was struck, I remember, about these college ball players. Now, this was in the late 30s by now. That they were different. They didn't swear. And... Uh, they treated me very well. And my heart began to respond to them. They never said a word to me about anything about Christianity or anything, never. But I liked the kind of ball players they were. I wasn't used to that. And that struck home to me without more than I realized. And I, I'm sure that just without them saying a single word to me other than about baseball. That, that helped prepare my heart when in the fall of 1940 I was saved. And we must uh, remember that. That our, our just our faithful, quiet, daily life, uh, God can use that. It isn't that we're not ever to say anything, but that we make sure when we do say something that it's the right words said at the right time to the right person. And this takes growth. This takes uh, experience, a lot of uh, failure, before we really come to know what we're doing, really usable by the Holy Spirit in a careful spiritual way. Now, those, those uh, college students, young students like that, they didn't really realize. They were just acting uh, naturally. They, they loved the Lord, and uh, they cared about others. They were interested in me. And it was so natural and uh, good. Uh, no pressure. They weren't uh, beady-eyed, uh, standing around me in a circle ready to pounce on me. My, the unsaved uh, are so sensitive to anything like that. The Christian who's uh, on the prowl, Christian who's ready to pounce, the unsaved is, is ready to leap and run. He, he's aware of that. He knows. He senses that right away. And we don't want to have that in our makeup. 
We want to, yes, there's a burden, there's a crushing burden for the lost, but we don't allow it to harm our outreach. We don't allow it to uh, frighten the unsaved away. It isn't expressed in that way. It isn't to be expressed in that way at all. Well, what does this add up to? It adds up to growth. That we simply come to know the Lord Jesus Christ in such a way that he's so real to us, he's so much a part of our daily life, that uh, it's the Lord Jesus reaching out to lost hearts. And he doesn't have any problem about that. He's, he's the one who knows how to touch the broken and the lost heart. He's the only one. And he does it through the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, who in turn works through Christians who are usable. Now, as far as a, a Christian mother is concerned, well, she has a, a, a very fine advantage in working with the lost mothers. And uh, as a Christian housewife and as a shopper, and all the details that have to do with uh, home. She fits in there. She's normal. She's natural there. That's her habitat. That's where she's trained. Uh, and that's uh, the best possible means of her outreach is to people who are in those realms. The secret of uh, effectiveness in any realm is to find your niche and take advantage of it. Find your niche and, and be normal and be free in it and not seeking to uh, get into a realm that you're not really fitted for. To find out where you feel freest and uh, most natural, where your burden functions, functions the most freely toward others, and that's your uh, ministry. And of course, it may be relatively simple to bring someone to a decision that they become saved, but that's when the real work begins. That's when the real responsibility begins, is when you have a newborn babe on your hands. That's when the Christian's work really begins. His ministry really begins to function. The tragedy is so many are brought to birth and they're left to lie there. And they're not fed and they're not protected and they're not encouraged and they're not guided and uh, they become sickly and uh, possibly one of the cults gets a hold of them or they get into the wrong church they don't know they don't know and the lord uh, the lord uses shepherds that's the way he's worked things out he uses responsible christians and it's a responsibility of the christian especially the one who's brought the person to the lord it's his or her responsibility to care for that lamb as a shepherd the Lord works through shepherds. <clears throat> so that uh, our thinking and our uh, whole goal must be way far ahead when we're thinking about someone uh, coming to the Lord or someone who has just come to the Lord. We must be thinking way out in front that our goal for them is maturity in the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether they've come to the Lord as yet or whether they've just come to him our thinking must be geared to that goal. And that will have a tremendous effect upon how we handle the, these individuals, how we approach them, how carefully we cultivate them even before they're saved, getting them ready. Because we know that the, the healthier the birth, the more progress is going to be made in growth. And if we simply talk them into something and bring them to a decision uh, and then seek to have them grow, there's going to be uh, frustration, there's going to be failure all along the line because of the poor beginning. So for our own ministry, for our own peace of mind, for our own progress, we must make sure that we carefully prepare the individual before and after conversion. We might think for a moment of First uh, Timothy 4.6. Wonderful thought there, First Timothy 4.6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, unto which thou hast, hast attained. Well, what's Paul saying here to Timothy? He's saying that um, 
if you are nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, and if you are growing, then you will be a good minister of the Lord in uh, putting others in remembrance of these things. But you can best share with others that which is real in our own lives. It's, it's the same in any realm. How are you going to teach a young girl how to make a pie if you don't know how to make one yourself? How are you going to uh, bring your children up if you aren't going to draw upon your own experiences and mistakes years ago? Uh, the fact that you were a child once it helps you to more fully understand. And the trouble with a lot of us adults is we forget that we were like them at one time. And we try to handle these children uh, as though they had the responsibility of adults. We forget, even the teenagers, we forget that uh, once we were teenagers and that um, we probably didn't do as well as they're doing today. so that God takes us through things and uh, trains us so that we in turn can adequately train others. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, unto which thou hast attained. Well, it's interesting. Before I was saved, when I was around uh, Wheaton College there, around the ball players, I was struck by their naturalness. And uh, they weren't trying to be something and do something. They were just that way. And that had a profound effect upon my heart. And the Lord used that to prepare me. I remember uh, I found out after I was saved that... Uh, a dear pastor there who was burdened for me and he was praying for me and he had some of these ball players they would gather together and they would pray for me once a week pray for others too but they were praying for me I didn't know it at the time but I was going through a very difficult time then and I was uh, drunk pretty much of a time all during that summer of 1940 And these fellows, they were those who lived in the Wheaton area, and they were around all summer. And they were watching me around. And I remember the, uh, the pastor told me later that they came to him and complained. They said, well, the more we pray for him, the worse he gets. What's the use? And they wanted to give up. But they didn't. And then in September when I was saved, all alone in my room, and I called the pastor and let him know, and he in turn let these boys know, well, you can imagine the joy in their hearts that they hadn't given up, that they kept on praying, depending upon the Lord. Well, we'll speak a little about prayer later on here, intercession. But the point for now is that they were normal, natural, young Christian boys, young men. And just because of that fact, and that they prayed from their hearts and trusted the Lord, even though their faith was uh, strained at times because they went by sight, yet the Lord held them to the work at hand and they continued to intercede and the Lord saved me when they didn't even know it saved me all alone in my room I didn't even know John 316 and no one was there except the Lord himself and I was born again well I remember I was so afraid of church people and uh, this pastor wasn't able to get me to go to church for almost a year after I was saved, even though I was definitely born again and loved the Lord, studied my Bible every day, eight and ten hours a day. I still was afraid to go to church. 
because of all my background, because of all my uh, what I'd gone through. He could not get me to go to church. And uh, I remember the first time he did get me to go to church. He came to my house and got me and made arrangements and he, he took me to a prayer meeting. And I didn't know it, but he had everything arranged. There was a large crowd there, and they had a buffet dinner for afterwards so that I could get acquainted with these Christians. He was really going to merge me into the church and get me acquainted and break down this barrier. Fine idea. Well, we got there, and I normally gra and naturally gravitated to the last seat in the last row, crouched back there. And I was in the next to last row. I wasn't in the last row. I would have been if there had been any empty seats. But they, they had a, sang a few hymns, and then he asked for testimonies. I remember looking down the aisle there, way down, he was way down in front there, smiling encouragement to me, and he was asking for testimony. Two or three folks got up and gave a word of testimony. It didn't dawn on me that he wanted me to get up and testify. I was too fearful of it all. That didn't get through to me. So since I didn't get up or anything, why he said, well, we'll have another hymn. And they sang one or two more hymns. And then he said, well, let's have some more of these testimonies. Anything anyone like to get up and say what the Lord has done for them. Well, then it dawned on me that uh, here was my opportunity to uh, share the wonderful things the Lord had done for me and how precious he was to me. So I completely forgot myself and I stood up. And I shared how the Lord had saved me almost a year before. My hunger for the Word, what a good time I was having in the Word. And that um, <clears throat> I asked them to pray for me, that I might grow. Well, when I sat down, someone stood up behind me <clears throat> in the last row, and he broke down in tears, and he was confessing to the group, that he had been in high school with me years and years before as a Christian. He was a Christian in high school. But they had never, never said anything to me. And I was quite a, one of the wild ones in high school. I don't know how I ever graduated, but he never had uh, witness to me or anything. And he said at that time his life wasn't a testimony of itself, really. So he, he completely broke down and he, he rushed out of the meeting and, and went home. If I were to tell you his name, many of you would know of him today, 25 years later. But that was very touching. And here it was a confession that, um, and then I, as I, later on as I got into church and uh, got to know a lot of the folks, I kept running across old high school mates, fellas I'd been on the football team with, a baseball team, and girls that I knew in class. And here they were in this church and in the other Wheaton churches. Uh, and uh, I, I would ask them, well, uh, were you a Christian back in high school? And many of them say, yes, I was saved very early in life. And I often ask them, well, how come I didn't know about that? How come you didn't say anything to me then? Well, of course, they didn't have much to say, and they were young then and young in the Lord. But even so, I couldn't understand that at the time. And then uh, something else. That as the next uh, few years went by, a couple of years, it was after the Well, no, it was uh, just that first year that I was saved that uh, 
I realized why God hadn't spoken to me back in high school. I never would have listened, and I wasn't ready. But that, of course, that doesn't uh, justify the fact that these young high school students weren't burdened for the lost around them and weren't in some way carefully reaching out to them. But it's interesting about the Wheaton area. When I came back from the Army, having been a Christian by that time uh, five years, very hungry to grow and uh, burdened for other Christians, and I stayed home in the Wheaton area for a year after I got out of the service, and I, I, noticed, uh, I noticed quite a change. And I think the war had a lot to do with this. But I noticed that the uh, the campus was different. And let's not forget that I was looking at it through different eyes now, as a Christian, and as a Christian who was burdened for others to grow. And I saw the whole Wheaton area in, different, in a different uh, light. But I began to realize that uh, all these wonderful fundamental churches around, sound churches and all the wonderful activities and the best preaching and all, that... Uh, it was not doing for me what my heart hungered for. I was not really growing. Everything was so done for me. Everything was there. And it was not really healthy. It was just pasted on. So that I wasn't really growing during that year at all. I And I was studying constantly on my own. But the churches, the, the fellowship of the Wheaton area was not really good for my growth. I realized that. And the students were different at the college. and uh, Many of the men were coming back from the army, you know, and uh, getting in as GIs. And there was a different atmosphere. There was a different attitude. And uh, those, uh, many of those dear, effective young Christians weren't in view. There was a lot of, um, there was a different level of spirituality around there. And my heart was quite broken at the change. Well, of course, after that year at home, uh, I was led to leave Wheaton. I got out of Wheaton. I went to New York. I wanted to be alone with the Lord. I wanted to work these things out and uh, study as the Lord led me, and uh, uh, it was a relief to get away from all of that that was just uh, cut and dried. So that um, in time, in the New York area, after I was married, oh, five or six years after leaving Wheaton, we began to hold home meetings for hungry Christians. And uh, our first group that we had, the Lord, first group the Lord gave us, we would meet in a, an apartment. If I remember rightly, now it was once a month. And this group were about 30 Christian leaders. Most of them were Christian workers, Christian leaders. But all of them had come to the place where they were failing in their Christian outreach. And their converts and those that they'd won to the Lord were, were not seeming to hold up. They were having trouble with them. There wasn't, wasn't the life and the growth there. And they were all burdened and uh, they were all had been blaming those that they were dealing with, uh, that they weren't responding. But they had all come pretty much to the place where they began to realize that they were the ones. They hadn't been growing and they weren't effective. The Lord wasn't able to use them. And it seemed to be the same heart burden for all of these folk that, that, that had the Lord drew together in this little meeting from all over the New York area. <clears throat> and there were about, oh, I think about 30 that would come on Friday night. I can't remember if it was once a, once a month. It might have been twice a month. But we met for three years. And we used the uh, large Paxson book, 
Life on the Highest Plane by Ruth Paxson as our textbook. Because the need for these individuals was personal growth, that the Lord could effectively use them. And we had a wonderful time. We would uh, take a chapter, a meeting, and uh, we would assign different one each time to take this book home and study it, and come back and uh, read the best part of the chapter, the main part of each chapter, read paragraph by paragraph. Read a paragraph and stop, and we discuss it. And it was a discussion meeting centered upon this chapter. And my, my job in the meeting was to hold the conversation and discussion to the subject and to answer any questions that I could answer that would be asked. Very open and very healthy meeting. And that went on for three years where these Christian workers who had been in the Lord's service for many years, many of them, uh, had come to find out that it wasn't so much a doing, it was being. And their own personal responsibility of growth would begin to really uh, produce the fruit of their lives, the fruit of the Spirit in their lives would produce the fruit in other lives, and there would be a ministry that would stand up, a ministry that the Lord could use. And that was the beginning of our of our home meetings. My, we learned a lot in those three years, as you can imagine. And I certainly would like to have tapes of those meetings. But of course, we probably wouldn't be able to publish the tapes or share them because these groups, as they stay together for three years, and most of them are married folk, couples, we get into some uh, subjects <clears throat> each one of the group gets to know the others and there's openness and we get into things about marriage and the home and all that has a great deal to do with our service as you know so that we really couldn't share these things on tape very personal meetings very wonderful but anyway I, I, I'd like to share something with you about that first meeting first series of meetings I, I there are a lot of things I'd like to share with you on these tapes about this work and, and things that we run into uh, examples that we could use but I can't do it because it isn't fair to those to whom we minister to use their uh, experiences in a public way it isn't fair to refer to these things really so uh, we just can't do it once in a while though when it's all right a certain situation that really doesn't matter, uh, I'll share with you. But not very often. And in this, this instance here, I'd like to share in the matter of time. In the matter of time and our working with others, whether they're unsaved or Christians, not to be afraid to give the Lord time. Now the Lord, if it's an unsaved person, we, you naturally feel, well, we, we must get this person saved, he's liable to die and then drop into hell. Well, God knows when he's going to take any individual. And he knows how much time there is. Some have a lot of time and some don't have much time. That's, that's true. But the Lord knows. And as we look to him and depend upon him, he will either have us work quickly or he'll open the thing up and give it time. We, we learn to depend upon him. And for the most part, it's a matter of time. Careful cultivation. And I remember an in interesting thing that uh, worked out. Uh, one of the friends in this original New York meeting had a friend at work that had uh, been recently saved, and oh, how he wanted him to come to these meetings and uh, get some food. But he couldn't, he couldn't get him to come. He couldn't talk him into coming. He never did get him to come all those three years. And he was just so burdened to have this friend come. He never would come. And I think he'd been a Christian for a year or so, and he wanted him to really grow. And uh, he never could get him out to meetings. As a matter of fact, the man wasn't too interested in growth at the time. So I remember how disappointed he was. Well, do you know, that was... Um, that was 12 years ago. Uh, 
that was 14 years ago and just this last year out here in Colorado Springs this man that our brother was so burdened for I found him right in my own church here right in our own church here he uh, is one of the leaders and within the last few months someone has given him a copy of the green letters our little book on growth and he's been studying that and within the past few months he told me recently he said brother I've been a Christian for over 16 years and I never knew a thing about self never heard of uh, identification really and uh, never have been really burdened enough to grow been active for the Lord all these years up and down but he said now I, I've come to realize through these letters uh, the facts about growth and I've, I've, I've discovered this wonderful subject of identif our identification with the Lord Jesus Christ and he said actually my favorite chapter in the green letters is the chapter on self well our friend in New York has no doubt been praying for this brother all these years and uh, we just give the Lord time he work it out better than we ever could so that it was a joy to contact our friend back there and uh, share with him how the Lord has been working, how the Lord has been answering his prayer. And as long as we're talking along these lines of time, a dear pastor and his wife came here last Sunday afternoon, last Lord's Day afternoon, and someone had given him a copy of the Green Letters, and they shared with us, they were from out of town, and they shared with us the fact that um, way back in Bible school, years and years ago, when they were both students, the founder of the school was a man who shared the identification truths in his classroom. And they remember these truths. But yet the the way the school was run and uh, all there was so so much law and self effort that they were held down by that, becoming involved in it that uh, the identification truths didn't really mean anything to them and they they didn't get any benefit from them. And uh, all through these years of ministry, churches here and churches there. It's only recently, within the last few months, they've been studying these little green letters. And of all the experience the Lord has taken them through, showing them the uh, futility of uh, seeking to live the Christian life and uh, to minister on the basis of law, uh, self-effort. All the futility, futility of that has uh, prepared them for the freedom that is in the Lord Jesus Christ and in the, the truths of our identification with him. And they were uh, overjoyed to be introduced to these truths once again now that they're prepared. And I think of another pastor that we're in touch with who, um, back in his seminary days, there was a member of the faculty who was seeking to share these deeper truths with the students and uh, was doing it by pressure. Well, you need this. This is the thing you need, and uh, you better, you better uh, wake up. And this individual was uh, pressuring these young students about these truths. And of course, that's that's the worst possible thing that can happen. And uh, this pastor rebelled, and uh, he was upset about this, and uh, didn't want any to hear anything about it. And he went on that way for many years. He, he never did want to hear anything about so-called deeper truths for years and years and years. Well, the Lord understands all about this. And uh, this pastor had several churches and went through a lot of things where the Lord was preparing his heart. And now, during the last 
couple of years, he's come in contact once more, once more with the identification truths in the Word, and uh, on a different basis altogether. His heart and life have been prepared, and of course the presentation this time has been just the opposite of the very slow and very careful and understanding approach and not sharing anything unless the heart is ready for it. And he appreciates this, and he's responding. And he realizes the importance now of these truths and uh, our life in the Lord Jesus Christ and all. So that uh, now that now there's all the difference in the world. Well, it isn't only the approach that matters, but it's the prepared heart that all of these years have prepared this leader. So that uh, when the truth is presented in the right way, at the right time, there is a healthy response. I think of this verse in First Peter five two. First Peter five two. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight of it not by constraint, but willingly, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. <clears throat> well, there, there's that word example, that uh, these things become real in our lives and people observe, people watch. Uh, the unsaved has every right to observe the life of the one who is seeking to minister to him. And the Christian has every right to watch uh, those who would seek to share things with them. They have the right to think these things through and to make sure that uh, that's what they need. They must be aware of their need. They're uh, responsible, intelligent individuals on their own, and they have a right to make up their mind. It's very important that they do and not that they go along just because someone else is dragging them along or pushing them along and pouring information into them and uh, seeking to hold them up. That's not uh, nothing healthy about that and nothing that will hold up in the long run. But that we carefully make sure that we grow and the Lord will have a ministry for every growing Christian. I think one of the most effective ministries possible is a mother uh, watching the neighborhood for other mothers unsaved or other young girls who need a friend. They can find them in the church or they can find them in the neighborhood. Young Christian girls who need some encouragement and guidance need to be interested in this thing or that thing of the Lord. That as you pray and watch and wait, the Lord will lay someone on your heart. And you can cultivate them. You can have them over to your home now and then. Find out what their interests are. And uh, develop them along the lines in which they're interested. And uh, let them know that you care about them and that they mean something to you. And my, these young youngsters these days, they just blossom under that. And uh, open wide like a flower and respond. And they'll take in almost anything you, you, you share with them once they're prepared, once they gain uh, confidence in you. And uh, a busy mother in a home can uh, have one or two friends like this that um, my, uh, in a series of four or five years, uh, half a dozen or more lives can be very definitely affected in this way and without really going out of your way and without spending a lot of time hardly noticeable in your busy schedule. But oh, that personal, quiet, careful, prayerful, burdened outreach. Natural, normal, nothing out of the way, right? Finding out what the individual's interests are and fitting right into that. Not uh, pushing them or pulling them over into what you want them to see or have. But fitting into their thinking so that they'll be at home and open. Oh, there's a wonderful cultivation ministry there. 
either with the lost or with young Christians. I think that um, I know there are many of you who have uh, Sunday school classes or little Bible studies maybe in your home or maybe you want one. Well, if you have one or if you're thinking of having one or if the Lord gives you one in the near future or whatever, uh, my one plea would be this. See to it that you share food, not just information. Uh, most people that you probably be in touch with are in church or going to church, and they're going to get the overall teaching of the Word year in, year out by sitting under the pastor's ministry. He goes right through the Word often, and, and they get the overall teaching along with their own study. But your burden should be the underlying food for growth that is so effectively shared in a small group of hungry hearts. Sharing the Lord Jesus Christ, sharing the truths that have to do with growth. Uh, so many dear friends, uh, dear folk, are teaching uh, the book of Revelation. They're teaching Jeremiah. They're going through the Old Testament. And my, fine as that is, the thing is to concentrate upon the truths that have to do with that person's everyday life, that they might grow and develop in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they might feed upon Him, that they might become strong and mature and responsible Christians. They'll learn about Revelation. They'll learn about the Old Testament. They'll learn about the overall uh, truth of the Word. But your heart burden is to see them grow on specific food. We have, we have, our churches are full of Christians that have an overall knowledge of the Word, but when it comes right down to the specific truths that have to do with Christians' everyday problems and have to do with the Christian becoming mature and responsible, well, nine out of ten of our Christians don't know the least thing about that. It's all vague to them, and uh, they know about justification. They don't know a thing about identification. Well, if the Lord is bringing you into these things, you're the one that he wants to use to share these things with others. They're not going to get them in the average church pulpit, any, from the average church pulpit anyway. And actually, the pulpit isn't the place for these truths to be shared. They're really effectively, most effectively shared on a man-to-man -man basis, on a heart-to-heart -heart basis, or in small groups where, where hearts are ready or are being prepared. These deeper truths are not shared in a general way. There's too much to them. There's too much heart pre preparation required. It just isn't done that way. So that uh, anyone who the Lord is training in these truths has a unique ministry of uh, sharing carefully with others. I think of a uh, classic, an old classic book that's still in print. It's called Every Member Evangelism. It's by J.E. Conant. If you want to jot that down, if you don't know the book, Every Member Evangelism by J.E. Conant. C-O-N-A-N-T. It's published by Harper, Harper and Brothers. You can get it at your bookstore. If they don't have it, they can order it from Harper's. <coughs> for you. It's an old-time book, <coughs> but it is, the, the thesis of the book is not to uh, sit in church and expect people to come to church, to unsaved, to come to church to uh, hear the message, but that the church is for the individual Christian to become fed and to become strong in the Lord, and then he goes out from there. He doesn't uh, sit there and wait for the unsaved to come to him, but he goes out to the unsaved, either in his home or his neighborhood or at work, and he goes fishing where the fish are. But the training is in his church. It's a reversal of what we have today. And then the good part, the main part of the book, the, the real important part of the book, is the fact that the, the 
the Christian is developed along the lines of identification truths that he's established in the Lord Jesus Christ so that he becomes uh, effective uh, soul winner because it's not I but Christ. A very fine book. Christian service based upon the not I but Christ life. Well, dear friends, here our time is gone, and we have been taking it easy during this period because now we're going to have to begin to work hard and study as we enter chapter 6, having to do with Romans 6 and our identification. We're going to do some more study in that realm, verse by verse, and realm, verse by verse, and take a very close look at what Paul is saying here about our relationship to the Lord Jesus and how it is to affect our daily life. Our Father, we thank Thee for <clears throat> every opportunity that Thou dost give us to touch other lives, to be channels for Thee to reach out and draw hearts to Thyself, to be nothing that Thou mayest be everything. We thank Thee for everything Thou dost take us through in our daily life in order to bring this about for all the training thou dost give us in our Christian walk that we might be usable servants for the sake of others. We pray thou wilt keep our hearts hungry, that thou wilt keep our hearts hungry to grow and keep our hearts burdened for others. That thou wilt be glorified in our daily lives that thou wilt see the travail of thy soul and be satisfied. And we trust that thou wilt prepare our hearts now for our further difficult study. We depend upon the Holy Spirit to open thy word to each one of our hearts. And we thank thee for the privilege of seeing and learning all that Thou hast done on our behalf, all that Thou art seeking to make real in our daily walk. Father, we thank Thee for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Think for a moment of that word, believe. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe? Uh, why doesn't it say toward us who work and toward us who do? No. Uh, the Lord Jesus wants us to learn to depend upon Him and believe that He'll work through us and come to know Him and uh, grow in Him and he'll, he'll do His work. He'll touch hearts. He'll cause them to respond and they'll respond in a healthy, living way.